Good morning, everyone. As John mentioned, I'm Pastor Rich, and I'm here to bring the word. I'm going to bring it. <laughs> I'm gonna... So if you have a Bible this morning, turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, let me just say, so good to have you here. Uh, thank you to those of you joining us uh, online. It's so good to have you participating with us. And so if you have a Bible, make sure you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 7. We're going to look at one verse today and really move this series forward, all right? Pastor Eric's going to appreciate that. That was funny. You can laugh. Um, we're not going too far, are we? We're going to cover one verse uh, this morning, but uh, a lot of stuff there. Uh, before we jump into our passage this morning, let me just say uh, thank you to everyone who participated in the uh, drive through food pantry, appreciate all of your help. Uh, those who came out yesterday to help distribute the food. Our Serve Your City group that helped uh, with preparations all along the way. Uh, I want to say uh, especially uh, thank you to uh, Danny Franceschini, who really helped and did a lot of stuff, stepped up and really got involved. And uh, thank you to you for bringing in stuff, bringing in bags of food. We were able to really uh, bless people. Those bags were full of uh, some good food. And uh, we were able, actually, to give out uh, double portions at the end. Uh, we had some extra stuff, and so we were able to just bless people. So thank you very, very much for your participation. Really uh, appreciate your generosity. I uh, want to also mention, again, we do have growth track today, 1 o'clock in the conference room. Uh, you can catch us on Zoom as well. So if you're interested in being a part of that, I hope you'll come and, and join us. Uh, great way to find out about... Uh, how to get involved at Cornerstone. There's just a lot there. You don't have to sign anything, do anything, commit to anything. If you just want to come and check it out, that's a great way to do that. Great way for you to get to know us, us to get to know you. So if you haven't done that, we'd love to have you join us today at 1 o'clock. Uh, also want to mention this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we have our first Wednesday service. So please uh, feel free to join us for a time of worship here in the sanctuary. Uh, looking forward to that. We usually have a little time of prayer as well, but uh, uh, good portion of the night is filled with uh, just worshiping and, and uh, you know, entering into God's presence. And then certainly last but not least, uh, this Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. So uh, if you have some time in your schedule, uh, maybe you can carve out some space at noon and uh, set aside some time to pray and join thousands, tens of thousands of people, I think, across the nation uh, that will be praying for our country that day. Hope you'll uh, have an opportunity to do that. Uh, whether it's in the morning or night, uh, you can go online. Uh, National Day of Prayer has resources. I'm sure there'll be live streaming things. And so uh, just want to encourage you to participate in that uh, and be a part of that and praying for our nation. Amen. That sounds like uh, a good thing uh, to do. All right. First Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 7. We've been in this series called Unshakable and uh, just looking at an unshakable faith in Christ. Uh, last week, Pastor Eric uh, spoke to wives, all right, talking about the issue of marriage. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about husbands. Uh, someone at the drive through food pantry yesterday said, um, hey, Pastor, there was a lot of elbowing going on last week, a lot of husbands going, hey, honey, uh, you know, uh, wives, uh, this is your opportunity this week to uh, throw some elbows back, all right? So get ready. If you're not sitting next to your spouse, if there's a chair between you, get close because you don't want to miss. If you have a kid between you, you know, move the kid, whatever you got to do, but just get ready. And instead of amens, just do a couple of these things, and uh, that would be great. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, uh, this is uh, what it says. Uh, Likewise, <clears throat> excuse me, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs of life with you of the grace of life. I read that wrong. They are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we come before you this morning, and uh, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, an infallible guide. So, Lord, we ask you to speak to us today, all of us, uh, Lord, whether we're in a marriage or not, whether we're planning for marriage and hoping for it, Lord, speak to our hearts today, uh, especially to us as husbands. Again, thank you for your word. Open our hearts. Lord, we, we come uh, to open our ears and listen. So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Well, our text uh, actually begins uh, this morning all the way back in chapter 2 and verse 13. In chapter 2, verse 13, Peter says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to kings, and then he goes on, right? That's where the conversation starts. That's the main thought. That's the, the main thing that he's been talking about since that verse. So everything that follows, right? Uh, Pastor Eric's message uh, on the government, uh, his message on work, and the message that he began last week on marriage, right? All of that is connected to this, right? Linguistically, right? Grammatically, right? It's all literally links back to this verse. The language of our text this morning, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Again, uh, the language there indicates a link back to that, right? Uh, again, uh, our text says, Husbands, likewise, that's the first clue. But again, the language of the text is pointing us back uh, to that verse where, again, Peter really begins to talk about these human institutions. Now, human institutions, not in the sense that they were created by human beings. They were created for human beings, not by human beings, right? Peter is addressing things that are present from the very beginning. And it's as if Peter is saying, listen, uh, be subject to these things. L you know, even the limitations that they may seem to place on us as human beings, right? I have put them there. God has put them there for our flourishing, for our benefit, right? And so if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3, what you're going to find, uh, these things are present there, right? Even in a world before the fall, there would be government, right? When God creates the man and the woman. When he creates humans, he makes them in his image and in his likeness. And he says to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, rule. Rule over the fish, rule over the birds, rule, right? There, there's, there are implications and, and an application of that passage that there are going to be structures and systems that are there for our flourishing. And so I think government would be there. It would be there for us to function as a human society that would help us to flourish and to grow. Of course, we see work there in the garden. God himself is working. Marriage is there in the garden. All of that before the fall. And Peter is reminding us as followers of Christ, as believers, to be subject to these institutions, to accept them, and to even accept what may seem like limitations placed on us by those institutions, right? They are there for our flourishing and for our growth. So again, government and work and then marriage. And in a world and in a, uh, a day when many of these things are being questioned, government, work, right? And marriage in particular, many of them being questioned and challenged and doubted and all of that, right? Peter is reminding us Right, to accept these institutions as put there by God for us and for, uh, and for our flourishing. And so uh, after having said all of that again, he reminds us right out of the gate, husbands, likewise, right? He's reminding us, men, that we are not free to do whatever we want and go wherever we want and and spend our money however we want, right? He reminds us here that, you know, once we enter into marriage, right, we are to submit, we are to be subject to that institution. So again, if you go back to that chapter 2, verse 13, and everything that Peter says, right, uh, submission and being subject, right, coming under those institutions looks different, slightly different in each of those, right? How we submit to the government and how we submit to our employers and how uh, submission is worked out in marriage between uh, man and woman, right? It's different. There are nuances. There are particulars that have to be worked out and understood. So as men, we are reminded that we are to give ourselves to 
to the marriages, right? That we're not free to play basketball three times a week. You know, we can't go on uh, fishing trips and hunting trips. We can't go golfing anytime we want. We can't spend our money anyway, right? There's another human being that we are uh, now living with. We are now uh, in a partnership, in a covenant with, that we must be mindful of, that we must be thinking of and considerate of. And so, again, right out of the gate, Peter is reminding us uh, of those limitations. And those limitations are actually there for our flourishing, our growth. And so, again, Peter reminds us uh, of these God-ordained institutions for us. But then he gives two very specific instructions to husbands. And the first one is that we are to uh, live with our wives according to knowledge. And so Peter says here in our text, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, right? Or according to knowledge, as with the weaker vessel. All right, all kidding aside. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, media team. Good job. Good job. <laughs> yeah. What is Peter getting at here? What's he talking about? Husbands, kind of in a literal way, it says, uh, husbands likewise, or husbands in the same way, live together with your wives is assumed, right? With your wives, according to knowledge. All right, so what is Peter getting at? He, the, the main thing that he's getting at, the main thing he is urging us to do, men, is to know our wives well, right? According to knowledge, to know our wives well, to know everything that there is to know about them, to know their strengths, their gifts, their abilities, their passions, their dreams, their hopes, their desires, right? Their longings for uh, their family, right? What they hope to get from marriage, what they hope to see in their kids, all of these things we are to know, right? We're to study our wives. As our own uh, Peter Graziano says, if you've ever been in our men's group, Peter is, uh, you know, loves these passages and he reminds us often, men were to be students of our wives, but not in an analytical way, right? We're not to study our wives and know our wives like we know a book or read a book or uh, look at a car or something like this. This is a human being with needs, with desires, with hopes and dreams, right? And Peter is reminding us in this text that, men, we have a responsibility to know our wives, to know all these things about them. And, of course, that requires our attention, right? We need to sit, we need to listen, we need to hear, we need to ask questions. We need to allow our wives to speak to us and talk to us about our relationship. And we're to listen and learn and grow, right? But Peter also reminds us here in our text that we are not only to know, right, the strengths and gifts and abilities and passions and all of those things, but we are to be especially aware of, especially knowledgeable about her weaknesses, her struggles, right? the things that she's wrestling with, the things that are, that are difficult and hard and challenging, right? I think that's what he means when he says, live with your wives, according to knowledge, as with a weaker vessel or as a weaker vessel. Now, Peter here cannot and does not mean uh, inferior in any way. He's not talking about that. He's not saying she's inferior intellectually or spiritually or even emotionally, right? He's not thinking of that. That's not what he's getting at. Uh, he can be possibly referring to physical strength here, right? Peter might be acknowledging that generally speaking, women are not as physically strong as men, right? Uh, uh, John Piper, kind of in a humorous way, uh, was listening to some commentary uh, on this passage, and he was talking about the Olympics and how in the Olympics, right, we don't see men and women competing against each other in the same sports. Uh, 
Yeah, there are women's events and there are men's uh, events, but he was quick to point out that uh, despite that, uh, most women, probably all of the women that were involved in the Olympics were far stronger than he was, uh, that could do quite a bit more than he could, right, physically speaking. So again, there's, I think, a general idea here that Peter might be uh, leaning in that direction, that generally speaking, men are stronger than women physically. I know this is true in the Cortez household, not the strength thing, but uh, that in our house, uh, there are differences. Uh, I'm usually a lot warmer than my wife, right? So I like to joke around that she's only uh, into me for my hot body. <laughs> Meaning when she's chilly, you know. So there are these differences, and I think Peter is just kind of generally referring to this, you know, and he's saying, man, I want you to think, the point is, man, I want you to think about your wife as someone who does have limitations, that someone who, who does have uh, weaknesses and struggles and trials, and I want you to be aware of those things. I want you to be mindful of those things so that you can be supportive and helpful, and you can step in and, and provide, right, the necessary help that she might need in any situation. I remember when I was back in college, Bible college, uh, the director of student ministries, his name is Dan Cuno, uh, they had bought a house near the Bible college. And uh, you homeowners will uh, resonate with this, right? They bought this home. And like a lot of homeowners, right, there was a lot of stuff to do before they could move in, right? They were renovating some stuff, painting other stuff. They wanted to redo the floors and fix this and change the bathroom. And so uh, they were working all day. Then at night, they would go to their new home and then work till late, right? 11 or 12 o'clock at night, do the same thing the next day. Every weekend, they would spend at the house fixing things up and repairing, you know, just getting it ready. Sunday they would come to church and then they would go home and work on the house again, right? Well, I remember at one point, I don't know what I was doing there. I was either helping out or something, but uh, Dan recognized that uh, this was just getting to be too much for his wife. And he said, you know what? We're done for today. There was a lot to be done, the pressure of getting in, the deadlines. And he said, you know, we're done. We're going to stop. I, I, you know, he said, he literally just addressed her and said, honey, I, it's just, I could see that it's affecting you. We're going to stop. We're not going to do anything for the rest of the weekend. These guys are going to leave. You go take a shower. We're going to go out to eat. We're going to relax. You know, that's the kind of thing I think Peter is urging here, that we would be men who can recognize, who are, who are aware of. We're knowledgeable, right? There's all kinds of knowledge that we need to have about our wives, right? Again, strengths and abilities and dreams and hopes, but we need to be especially aware of those areas of weakness, those, those challenges, those difficulties, so that we can be supportive and helpful and recognize and, again, step in. And uh, I don't know about you, but, you know, my wife is not weak in any sense of the word. She comes home sometimes uh, when she was working in her previous place. Uh, she worked at a dental office, and uh, uh, she worked, uh, she claimed she worked full-time, but it was only 37 and a half hours. It wasn't full-time. So I, you know, uh, right? she would come home after, literally, she would work four 10-hour days. You know, she would come home. As she'd walk in the house, she'd barely get her coat off and notice a laundry basket sitting there. She'll start folding clothes or she'll notice dishes in the sink and start doing those things. It was just not something. She would go and go and go and go. I, you know, husbands, we need to be aware of these things so that, again, we can, we can step in and help. And really, I have it on good authority, literally, that uh, if you do the dishes together, you'll have a better marriage. There is a study out there that supports that information, that doing the dishes together will strengthen your marriage. You know, those are the kinds of things I think Peter is urging here, that we have a sensitivity, that we have an awareness of our wives' limitations. All right. So that's the first thing that uh, Peter says here, that we need to be knowledgeable of our Wives, uh, we're to live with them according to knowledge, be aware, again, of everything. All that there is to know about her, but especially 
uh, those uh, weaknesses. I'm going to see if I can illustrate this one one other way. Uh, you know, I love coffee. I love to drink coffee. I drink coffee out of inexpensive mugs, right? And they're not fine things. You know, if they fall off the table, uh, they, they may not break. Uh, but if they do, it's not a big deal. Uh, the kind of mugs you can get at a yard sale for a nickel or you find people are getting rid of, that sort of thing. Uh, but in our house, we also have some uh, nicer mugs, and you probably do too, right? They're, they're a bit more expensive, uh, they're nicer, and though they are more fragile, it's not that they're less valuable. They're more valuable, right? And this is the kind of thing that per Peter is mentioning here, that, that this notion of, of weakness doesn't mean invaluable. It doesn't mean anything like that. Um, and we'll see uh, that a little bit more when we uh, move ahead. So again, let me ask you, uh, men, do you know your wife? How well do you know your wife? Do you know what to get her for her birthday? <laughs> I've, I've made a lot of mistakes there, right? Do you know what to get her for her, you know, her birthday or for Christmas? Do you, do you know what she likes? Do you, do you know, can you, you know, if you went out to eat, and uh, she was running late. Would you know what to order off the menu? Do you, ha you know, I know what she likes to do. Do you know what, ca you know, kinds of movies and music and things like, do you know her? Do you know her well? Do you know what to do to help her recharge her batteries and, and, and uh, find renewal? Do you know what you can do when you see those moments like, hey, this is bad. This is stressful. This is a difficult time. Would you be able to do something to help to invest in her life and, and see her grow and flourish and, and change? That's what we're called to as husbands. And you see that in Ephesians chapter 5 as well. We're to give ourselves uh, to our wives in that way to help them grow. And uh, I should say, by the way, here that there are implications in this language in our text uh, that apply to the bedroom as well. Uh, we're to be sensitive and knowledgeable about our intimate relationships with our wives, that we have that kind of understanding that we know her that well. So how well do you know your wife? Secondly, Peter calls us to show honor. And the language here, again, it's fascinating. I, I love looking at this, right? The, the first one is uh, we are to, to live with our wives according to knowledge as with a weaker vessel. Here we are to show honor as an heir of the grace of life, right? We're to know and we're to show. Hey, that's pretty good, right? We're to know and show honor but honor as someone who is an heir of the grace of life together with us. She is an heir, an heir of the inheritance and the promises that Peter speaks about in chapter 1, where he says this, this inheritance is reserved in heaven, kept and guarded for you that you will receive one day. She is an heir of that same promise. She is an heir of, of that inheritance as well. That woman that you wake up next to every morning, that woman that you go to bed with at night who looks so elegant with her pajamas tucked into her socks. <laughs> that woman is a queen of heaven. She's a queen of heaven, and we are to treat her like that. We are to recognize that. Peter is reminding us of that, that she's an heir. She's a son of the king, and we're, we're to show honor in that way. I, I think of, of uh, the Chronicles of Narnia here. Uh, I think of, of Lucy and Susie, and, you know, all of them, all the kids, right? But Lucy and Susan, right? In, in London, right, they are what? They're just kids. Just kids. But in Narnia, they're queens. All of them, they're kings and queens. And that's, that's an illustration of the truth of, of those, who, right? We give our lives to Christ while in this life, we look at each other and we think, ah, just another person or whatever, right? You know, but we are sons and daughters. We're kings and queens of, of God. We're, 
And again, that woman that you share your space with, that you're living your life together with, she is a queen of heaven. And Peter is saying we should show her honor as an heir of life. So how do you show honor? Um, some, just a few years ago, a, an artist at Princeton University wanted to um, honor a group of unsung heroes at the university. He wanted to do something that was typically reserved for presidents, you know, top donors, uh, founding members of the school, right? He wanted to paint portraits of these uh, kind of blue-collar workers at the university, the maintenance people, you know, the cafeteria people, the security guys and gals, you know, he wanted. So he did. He painted portraits and did them up and hung them all up as a, as a display and a demonstration of honor. He just wanted to honor them. Now, I'm not saying that we have to paint a portrait or get someone to paint a portrait. Maybe that works for you. Uh, but what I am saying is, is, man, we need to think about and be creative and think outside the box when it comes to honoring our wives. We need to figure out ways that will really resonate with them and connect with them when we honor them, right? Find ways to demonstrate, to show that honor to them. Many of you probably have seen the movie uh, A Beautiful Mind, uh, it's the story of John Nash, uh, a brilliant mathematician whose uh, life was uh, marred by schizophrenia, right? He's, he, uh, he he's, at times just loses uh, a grip on reality. Um, toward the end of the movie, uh, Nash is invited into the professor's uh, lounge uh, to, you know, he's invited in because he had received uh, this uh, Nobel uh, prize um, for his theory of dynamics of human conflict, you know, as it relates uh, to economics, right? Again, it was, it was a great moment. So Nash is invited into the lounge. He goes in, he sits down, he's eating. He doesn't know what to make of the thing. He's kind of nervous. Uh, you know, he's not even sure this is really taking place. Is, you know, is all of this real? Uh, because, you know, again, he recognizes his own struggle. And then slowly, uh, one by one, uh, the professors come up to him. You remember that scene? They walk up and they place the pen down there. Congratulations, John. You know, one by one, congratulations. You know, just putting, giving, you know, the, the pen, just a small gesture. It was a way to honor Nash, you know. And we need to, as husbands, and we're, we're really commanded by scriptures, taught by scripture to, to honor our wives, to find ways to show them honor, to demonstrate honor to them. Now that may be different for each and every one of us, but again, it, it's a way for us to, to do that. Uh, public service announcement, uh, Mother's Day is next Sunday. So, uh, Husbands, for those of you who have wives who have children and you have children, you know, how are you going to honor her on Mother's Day? French toast and bacon? That's what's going to happen at our house. You know, my wife's been talking about it for weeks. Can't wait to have French toast, you know. So, yeah. It's how we, how we're going to, how are we going to honor them? We need to find ways. We need to think about ways to honor honor our wives as heirs, as heirs of the grace of life. So two things that we are urged in this passage as husbands. One, to know our wives and know them well, know them personally and, and intimately and closely, right? Another human being created in the image of God, right? Uh, Again, this whole honoring thing doesn't begin with the New Testament. It goes all the way back to Genesis, doesn't it? Right, where, where God creates human beings and he makes them in the image and likeness of God. Male and female, both expressing and showing and demonstrating the image of God. Both given this 
royal commission to rule over the earth, right? Both of them, right? Peter reminds us, again, in our text, heirs of life. Together, we are, we are heirs of life. So we're, we're called to, to know our wives, made in the image and likeness of God, and heir uh, of the promises of God, right? And we're to show them honor. And then Peter says, we should do all of this so that our prayers are not hindered. So that our prayers won't be hindered. And that sounds like it means, right? Peter is saying if we, we fail to do this, our prayers won't be answered. I think that's the plain meaning of this passage. That somehow our relationship and how we live that out with our spouses has an impact on our praying. You know, Peter has said a few things about prayer in this book, and all of them are connected in some way to, to action and behavior. And it's interesting that here, again, as husbands, uh, if, if we do what is right, then our prayers will be helped rather than hindered. And so if you want your prayers to be helped and not hindered, you have to live with your wife in the way that Peter is talking about here. There has to be an effort to understand her, to know her, know her needs. There has to be a special attention given to her weaknesses and what she especially needs from you as her husband. There has to be a recognition that she's a fellow heir of the grace of life and the accompanying bestowal of Honor that goes with that, right? The honor that goes along with that. And when we live like this, with understanding and tender care, our prayers are not going to be hindered. But if we do not live like this, our prayers will be hindered. They're not going to be answered. Now, this could also mean, you know, if that we're not living like this, if we're not, you know, knowledgeable of our wife, if we're, we're not showing her honor, it could mean also that our praying together can be hindered, right? It's harder to pray together when, right, when there's something between us, right? And there's all, there have, I'm sure have been points in our lives when we're so mad at each other, right? We don't want to pray with each other. It's hard to pray with each other. When you're angry, it's hard to kneel down and say, let's pray. Right? It's difficult. And so Peter might be referencing that kind of difficulty in prayer when we fail really to, to you know, live in the way that we should. Right? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. Right? There are implications for God's presence and his response to prayer in those words. And Peter, I think, is reminding us when there's stuff between us, when we're not living the way that we should, men, Right there, that it makes us it makes it hard to pray, and when we're not living as Peter says here in our text, we're sinning. It has an impact on our praying, doesn't it? And so there's a call for us to, you know, be aware of that. Perhaps repentance for things. So again, if 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 prayers don't seem like they're being answered. Maybe you should have a conversation with your wife. Start there. That's hard to do, isn't it? Is there anything going on between us? How am I doing in terms of this text? Am I, am I, you know, am I not honor you in some way? Am I being insensitive to you and your needs? Am I, you know, start there. Maybe that's a reason some prayers aren't being answered. And if you're like me, you know, I'm praying for my children and, you know, I have a son that's, you know, not walking with the Lord right now, not going to church. We want to see that change, right? And, you know, maybe this afternoon I need to have a conversation <laughs> with somebody and say, you know, what's going on? Maybe I'll just tough it out a little longer before I ask that question. <laughs> it's hard to do, isn't it? It's difficult. But that's what Peter is urging us to do, to be husbands like that, you know, so that, again, it, the impact that it has on prayer is significant. And so he's inviting us to grow. He's inviting us, actually, to 
have these kinds of conversations with our wives and to listen to them and to hear them and to be open uh, to uh, their input. Uh, one scholar said this, uh, and I'll wrap up here uh, with this. So concerned is God that Christian husbands live in an understanding and loving way that their wives uh, live in a loving, understanding way with their wives that he interrupts his relationship with them when they are not doing so. No Christian husband should presume to think that any spiritual good will be accomplished by his life without an effective ministry of prayer. And no husband may expect an effective prayer life unless he lives with his wife in an understanding way, bestowing honor on her. To take the time to develop and maintain a good marriage is God's will. It is serving God. It is a spiritual activity pleasing in his sight. Amen. In just a few moments, we're going to share together uh, in communion. And so you have those elements ready. You can uh, begin to open them up. Do you have those communion? Does any, anybody who needs uh, uh, elements, just slip your hand up. Our ushers uh, will be happy uh, to get you uh, those. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to need one. Ladies, uh, I'll need uh, one if you can open it for me and uh, all the way get the, the bread out so I don't have to use my teeth and stuff like that. Uh, that would be awesome. Thank you, Kevin. And as we prepare our hearts for communion, I, wanna, I just want to mention this as we, we close. In the town of uh, Stepanavan, Armenia, thank you. Hey, wait, wait. You got to open it all the way up for me. We got to take it all out and, you know. <laughs> I should have had Nadine here to do that. That would have been great. <laughs> no, just bad. kidding, just kidding. No, yeah, that's right. Uh, and even the bottom part. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, and you can. <laughs> that's perfect. Thank you. In the town of uh, Stepanavan, I think I'm saying that right, Armenia, there, there was a woman who was called Palasan's wife. She had her own name, of course, but the townspeople called her by her husband's name to show her great honor. In 1988, there was an earthquake that had struck Armenia, and uh, it was in the middle of the day, and Palasan who was at work at the time that the earthquake hit, immediately fled and, and ran off to the school where his son was a student. And when he arrived there, uh, the building was already crumbling, but uh, Palisan entered the building and he began just grabbing kids and getting them out to safety, pushing them out and getting them, getting them out of uh, the rubble there. And uh, he managed to get about 28 children out of the building when an aftershock hit and the building collapsed entirely and um, killed Palisan and those who were remaining in the building. So the people of Stepanavan honor his memory and his young widow by calling her Palisan's wife. Listen, here's the point. Sometimes a person's greatest honor is not who they are, but to whom they are related. And man, I think that's true of our wives. I'm Nadine's husband. How's that? You know, that's that's a great, great honor. But the highest honor that any of us could ever have is to be called a disciple of Jesus Christ, to carry that name, to be called a Christian, uh, to be related to the one who laid down his life for us. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what we remember in these elements. We remember Jesus' death in our place for us. Don't forget that part. He didn't just die. He wasn't just a martyr. He was dying in our place. He was taking on himself the punishment that we deserve. 
The one who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That great exchange. He took the punishment. He took the agony. He took that separation when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was taking what we deserve. We deserve. God should look away from us because of our sin. But Jesus took that in our place so that God can look upon us. He can receive us. We can be a part of his family all because of what Jesus did on the cross. And this piece of bread, this wafer, this cup, reminds us of that. We are remembering that in this moment, all that Jesus has done. So if you're a believer, if you're someone who has come to Christ and, and asked him into your life, and we eat this bread and we drink the cup, remembering that, celebrating that, rejoicing in that, proclaiming that until he comes again. But if you're here today and you've never done that, I want to invite you to join in with us to come to Christ for forgiveness, to eat the bread and to drink the cup and say, Lord, I'm, I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. What these emblems represent, you're saying, I, Lord, forgive me. I, I've done things that I know are wrong. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Wash away my sin. Make me, take me into your family. Make me one of your children. And if you're here today, you've never done that. I want to invite you to do that. And again, I want to be clear that, you know, you eat the bread and you drink the cup, making that declaration of faith, making that expression of trust, saying I'm trusting in what Jesus has done for me to save me and forgive me. And so I'm going to pray. And if you're here and you've never done that, whether you're at home, whether you're here in this sanctuary, I want to invite you to do that this afternoon, right now, as we pray. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for these elements that we hold. They remind us of the broken body, the stripes, the nails, his death. This cup reminds us of the precious blood that was spilled in our place that cleanses us, that his death for us in our place is enough to forgive us and satisfies you. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. And, Lord, for those who are, who are joining us in communion for the first time, perhaps, who are saying by faith, I take this bread and I take this cup and I... I do it because I'm asking you to forgive me. Lord, for those who are taking that step of faith today, we pray that you will wash over them with your forgiveness, that they will literally feel cleansed today, that they will feel a new beginning and a fresh start, that old things have passed away, everything has become new. Lord, as they take that step of faith and putting their trust in you, Lord, again, we thank you for all that these elements mean for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat together. And let's drink together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace. You know, as we prepare to close, I'm going to pray in just a few moments. Let me, you know, mention a few things. If you took that step of faith this morning and gave your life to Christ, whether you're here or at home, uh, we would love to know that. We, it, you know, it's, it's our joy to be a part of what God is doing in your life. And so if you've taken that step, there's a number of ways you can let us know. Uh, there's a communication card in the seat in front of you. You can use that. Uh, and on the back side, there's a place or somewhere on the card, there's a place for you to indicate that you're giving your life to Christ. Put your name on there so we know who it is. And you can place that in one of the offering boxes 
uh, as you're leaving. If you're watching online, we have an online connection card, and you could do the same. It's a place for you to check off uh, a box to say, I'm giving my life to Christ. You can fill out the appropriate information, and then that would let us know that you took that step. You can also text the word, to uh, the word believe to the number on your screen, and that would let us know in that way as well uh, that you're taking a step of faith and you're ready to take the next step. And we would love to help you. We have Bibles at our information center. We have a, a fresh start devotional that will get you uh, going. We'd love to put all of that in your hands and help you, again, uh, take the next steps as you, you know, begin your relationship uh, with Christ. Also, I uh, want to give you an opportunity to respond uh, to the Lord, you know, we respond with prayer. We respond. There will be a place for you to come to these altars if you want to pray at the end of the service. If you want to come and kneel and seek God for whatever reason, you're free to do so. But one of the ways that we always respond is with giving, right? We we want to respond with joy, right? God loves a cheerful giver. And to say, Lord, uh, we come to bring our tithes and offerings and uh, missionary offerings. Lord, take this, use these gifts, and spread the gospel around the world. And so there's a number of ways that you can give here at Cornerstone. You can text your giving. You can use our Push Pay app uh, to help uh, you give. You can visit us online at cornerstonecheshire.com and give electronically that way. Uh, or for those of you who are here with us this morning, uh, you can use an offering envelope and uh, just fill it out and place it in one of the offering boxes uh, near the, the exits here to the sanctuary. There's some near the exits uh, by the main doors as well. And you can drop your offering uh, in there. And, and that would be a way for you, again, to worship uh, the Lord with your uh, giving. And then finally, I just want to remind you about Growth Track. Step one, uh, right after the service uh, at 1 o'clock, we'll meet in the conference room. Love to have you uh, there. Can I pray for you before we head out? Uh, let's let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name we come. Thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time in your presence. Lord, uh, we just ask for your blessing now as we go. Bless our lives, Lord. Bless our marriages. Bless uh, our homes. Lord, I pray for husbands all across this room that you would touch their lives, that you would help them to grow, to become uh, the kinds of husbands that we ought to be, that you talk about, that you show, that you teach us in your word. Help us to do that, we pray. Lord, so that our marriages will flourish, our families will flourish. Lord, even that the world might look and say, wow, that's different. I want something like that. Lord, help us, bless us. To that end, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a joy and a privilege to have you worship with us today. We hope to see you again next week. You have a blessed, blessed day. God bless you.